I am Mushtaq. I work for ThoughtWorks uh, Pune office. Uh, I have done this talk a couple of times now, once in Pune, uh, in uh, the Geek Night. How many of you have seen this talk? Okay, good, 10%, so not bad. So, sorry, I mean, it's, it's mostly a repeat. But it's a, it's a very detailed and uh, technical talk, so hopefully you will get something out of it again if, you, if you're watching it second time. We work with uh, collections a lot. Uh, how many of you are uh, familiar with Scala or use Scala collections in, in, in the programming? Again, 10% yeah, of you. Uh, and we are familiar with uh, uh, working with immutable collections, transforming them from one state to the other, and that's how most of the applications or a large part of the applications are built. Uh, but we never think about collections like pipelines. Pipelines uh, are a terminology where there is a notion of a data flow, uh, but that doesn't apply to the collections, immutable collections, especially in Scala where they are eager collections. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm going to put the whole thing together and, and uh, tell you what are the similarities and what, how pipelines exactly differ. Uh, what is the notion of streaming and then lazy streaming and then reactive streaming, right? So we'll, we'll build up that way. Uh, let's start with uh, the first part, which is a linear pipeline. Now these are eager, eager in the sense uh, we take a set of values uh, and once we do the transformation on those set of values, we get a new set of values, right? So they are, uh, they're allocated in memory. That's, in that sense, they're eager. Lazy would have been that, okay, just specify what you want to do and, and only in the end uh, you will materialize. So I have, in the linear flow, I have a, on the disk I'm reading a file which has a lot of data. I'm, I'm showing only some items there. And I say that, okay, read uh, these items. So as soon as I say this, these items will come in memory. And then I say that, okay, for all these items, do an operation square. So these are numbers, so I will get squared numbers. And then finally I say that, okay, take top two not top two, but take the first two of uh, these two items and then I will get one and four, right? But at each stage, I will be creating a, a new collection, new set or new whatever sequence. Uh, this is how the Scala collections or any eager collections uh, work, right? And this is, this is very easy to reason about, you know, how much memory is being allocated at each stage. Uh, and you are careful. For example, if this file is one GB file, you will never do this because you would know that uh, I don't have that much memory, especially in the server side, especially if this is a service where many people will make a call. So you won't use this kind of a programming model if uh, the data is large and it can't fit in memory. One of the advantage of keeping things in memory is that reasoning about the complicated graphs which will naturally emerge as you program uh, is, is very simple. So for example, in the second stage, if uh, after reading from a file, you wanted to do two operations, squaring all of all the numbers and then doubling all the numbers. Yeah, you will just pass this collection to two different functions and they will, one will map and do square, one will map and do double. You wouldn't even think what are the implications, are you reading twice or not? No, you're not reading twice. You will just read once because it in, it's in memory, you just share it, it's immutable, so you're free to share it. And uh, uh, further down the stream, you can say take two from the first one, take one. They are all separate, right? Easy to reason about at the cost of getting everything in memory. Now, let's let's take a quick demo and see how 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 it works. What are the what are the implications? So I'm going to work with uh, some numbers, 20, 1 to 20, right? Some numbers, and then I'm going to say that uh, 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 create a list of these numbers and then do two operations. One is a map. Uh, which uh, one is a map with a square and one is a map with doubling. So square will just square and double. And then I say that, okay, take 10 out of the first operation and take five. I'm, I'm just doing what I showed in a slide. So I have 20, num num 20 items and I want to deal with the first 10 for the first one and the first five for the second one. And I want to see how the operations happen. So here actually result is not important. The side effects are important, so even though it's a map function and immutable collection, I'm, I'm, I have print lines just to, just for the demo purpose. So let's run this. I'm forgetting the shortcut here. Sorry. Okay, so let's see what happens. Uh, I think the fonts are too big, or maybe let it be. So, so first, all the items are being read, right, from whatever is the source. Source is like some 
file, assume that. And then all the items are being squared, right? Because map with a square is the first line. And then all the items are being doubled, right? Even though this was not what we wanted, I mean, we don't care, but uh, this is excessive. We just wanted to deal with the 10 elements for squaring and five elements for the doubling. But because these are eager operations and I'm printing the side effects, uh, you, you see the sequence of orders. All of them will be read, all of them will be squared, and all of them will be doubled, right? So this is another, another problem uh, with, uh, with the in-memory collections. Is that clear? So now let's, uh, uh, let's explore that what happens with lazy collections, or suddenly now you can call them pipelines, because uh, lazy means uh, you don't, at each stage, you don't get data in memory, you just specify what needs to be done. And in the end, somehow the data flows through that pipeline and, uh, and the results, results are obtained. So same example, uh, but uh, I, have, I have a read operation, a square operation, a take operation. But if this were a lazy, and, and just to visualize it, right, more conc concretely, if you're using C sharp uh, and link collections, right, this is how it will, it will work you will have some terminal action. Even in Java 8 collections, this will be the same. You will have some terminal action which will dictate when the data starts flowing. But till that point, it's just a specification. So when you say that, okay, read, nothing is being read. So when you say this read, right, you say that, okay, source dot read, dot map square, dot take two, nothing is happening. It's just a specification which is being staged somewhere in your, in your application. And then for each is a terminal action. It's also called sync in a, in a pipeline world where there is a source and the flow and the sync, right? It's called a sync. So that terminal operation will trigger the whole data flow. So what will happen is the terminal action will say that uh, give, me, give me the next element uh, and uh, to, the, to the previous, which is a take stage. And then that will say that, okay, because I want to provide one element downstreams, let me get one element from upstreams and so on. And, and it will, the call will go all the way till the source. And then first element, which is one, will, will, will be given to the pipeline, right? It will come to the read, then to the square, then to the take two, because it qualifies, it is the first element, and then it will be provided to the sink. So those many hops will take place. And then for the second element, because I, my sink will, work on all the elements of the pipeline. For the second element, same call will happen. It will, it will call the next and the next and the next and then the second element will be emitted two, uh, which will be squared to four and which, because it's the second element it will be taken. But now, the pipeline will terminate because uh, the take two operation will, uh, uh, will uh, is qualified to give you only two items. So third of item doesn't make sense. So the sync will terminate naturally at that point. So this is, uh, uh, this is what uh, will happen with the lazy pipelines. So th the next calls which are happening are happening to the iterator. So iterator is the underlying implementation of all the collections in, in, the, in, the, in the Scala as well as in, in the Java C sharp. So what is happening, that next call is the iterator's next call and that iterator calls the upstream iterator's next call and so on, right? But, but this pipeline, even though it is lazy, it is pull based. So the sync is, is dictating that, okay, which element and when and, and, and so on, right? Now there is an alternative to that, which is a push-based pipeline where uh, you, you, don't, uh, you don't actually need uh, uh, the downstream uh, or a sync to dictate. So, so see the second example where uh, instead of making, a, making use of iterator and the next call on the iterator, we have something similar API, but it is based on the callback called on next. So instead of making a call next, which will give me a value, the upstream will push a data on, on next of the, of the next, uh, of the downstream. So the flow is little bit different here. Flow needs a trigger, not always, but in the cold pipelines that will de define very soon, the, the whole pipeline will need a trigger, and that trigger here is provided by another sync. And the moment the trigger happens, the source will start emitting data because now it has a callback on which the data can be pushed, which is an on next callback. 
and uh, it will uh, uh, the, uh, it will push on the on next of read and then read will push on on next of uh, square and so on and that's how the data will flow and reach reach the sink now why why i would do this this is a bit complicated right well one one thing is uh, i i'm avoiding the calls of iterators next which are going all the way right in the first in the first pull based uh, pull based diagram so for each item i need to make those hops if those hops are across the network then they could be expensive in terms of delays right so what i want to do i want to say that okay i am ready and i am subscribed and then i want the source to start pushing the data and that's how i get it but the story will not be complete and the push will not be will not have much advantage if there is no buffering so if i make a if i push data on on next but you know what that on next body is doing the computation and pushing on the on next of the downstream that is not going to work because then it's a even though you got some advantage of avoiding hop it's still a blocking call if your sync is blocking then the whole pipeline will be blocked even though source is ready to push you a lot of data it will be blocked it will it will call on next but on next will not return because in the in the in the body of on next someone is calling the next on next and and so on so the whole pipeline will be blocked so you get some advantage but not much it's a, it's, a, it's still a blocking uh, implementation and if you are across the network it's not good enough so what you need is a buffer in a push based system uh, for the for the good throughput low latency you need a buffer and that's why that black a uh, thing which which i have depicted there those represent buffer at each stages and now theoretically we have a very good system that as soon as the sync attaches and says i am subscribed so starts starts pushing data at at its own rate and the and it pushes uh, uh, on the buffer of the next stage and the next stage will start consuming the buffer and start pushing on the on the buffer of the next stage so each stage is kind of decoupled uh, so they can function at their own rate and uh, uh theoretically you can get a very good throughput because now there is there is no blocking there is no wait there is no wait for for a call to the next of an iterator now this model is good but there is a obvious uh, a downside of this this uh, approach right can can anyone point out those who have not attended the talk earlier so yes yes buffer buffer can go uh, uh, out of memory right i mean buffer has to be finite you can have infinite buffers uh, but then uh infinite buffers will basically affect the whole application because now they will take the memory of the allocated to the entire application in the out of memory errors will will happen so yes i mean this is a obvious problem it's it's a problem with any queuing right where where uh, you will very soon run out of memory so there is a third approach uh i think the the third approach is not very new but the way it is being articulated and specified uh, that is something new which tries to combine the these two approaches the pull based approach where the iterator uh next call is used and the push based approach where on next events of the downstreams are called and the buffers right what it does is it combines the two and that's why the the, the, the third diagram is a, is a combination of the two but with a difference now you notice that uh, the on next call uh, which i have specified here uh, was a, was a dotted line which means that it is it could be a non blocking call you don't have to uh, if there is a buffer i just call on next it puts the data in the buffer and comes back right it's a fire and forget call so it's a async call now in the last diagram equivalent to the next there is a request call right and that is also dotted line which means even that is a async call so which means that once a sync attaches right it's not enough for a sync to attach and say trigger that i am ready it should also demand that how much it wants to consume how much data it's it needs from the upstream usually it can just say that okay i need the next one that is fine that won't be very efficient so you can batch you can say that request it's parameterized with a number n and that could be 4 5 10 20 20 depending on how you configured your system and now that is the contract which will be respected by upstream so when sync says that i am requesting for four items it's a fire and forget async call it never it, it doesn't know when i will get four but the contract is that i will not get more than four as soon when upstream has enough data it will start pushing me without now 
uh, waiting for, for, for my confirmation because it knows that downstream is capable of holding four items now, it has requested. Not only that, it can also batch, it can also say that okay, I don't have data, I got a request for four, then I got a request for 10, so total 14 items can be sent, downstream is ready. So once it starts getting data, it will start pushing 14 without, without a delay, right? And now this will continue all the way upstream like a next call on the iterator. So, so the stage which is take will, will do a request of two items. Why? Because it knows for whatever reason, even though downstream is asking for me four, uh, I can't, I, I don't have much memory because I, I work slowly. So I will request only two, right, to, to my upstream. And then will request two and so on, right? So in a way, this, this, the final approach is a combination of the first two approaches, but with a difference that the demand which is, which is happening in the iterator based, pull based system in the first line, uh, happening in a synchronous call and one item at a time and blocking, uh, but the request call is parameterized with a number so you can, you can ask for n number of items. It is async, it is non-blocking, uh, but it's a limit, a contract that what is the max I'm ready to, to handle. And with this arrangement, uh, you, you can be, you can implement systems where you won't, you won't run out, uh, out of buffer space or uh, out of memory errors in, in your application. So it's a hybrid approach. Is that, is that clear? I think that was the, that was the main part uh, uh, of the discussion. And uh, this approach is being uh, uh, formalized in a, in a specification called reactive streams and that's where the, the name of the title reactive streams. Uh, and there are many systems which implement that. I use, uh, ACA based implementation. Have you heard of ACA? How many of you know about ACA? Okay, so yeah, 50 percent. So ACA is a actor based system and uh, on top of that you can implement uh, protocols, servers and stuff like that. Uh, but it is message passing fire and forget. It, it is not a streaming system. Uh, what what ACA streams which is one of the extensions of ACA which is which is very new gives you is the implementation of this hybrid approach on top of actor model. Uh, and it follows the specification of reactive streams whether, where it will, it will have this uh, request, uh, uh, downstream will, will have to send me a request and I have to respect that. Now because it's a standard, uh, many other systems also implement that. For example, Rx Java has a, has an extension uh, which will give you the same, same uh, uh, conformance to the, this protocol, which means I can, I can convert between a stream of ACA, ACA streams and Rx Java stream with, with simple calls because they are, they are following the same API or SPI, the, the service programming interface internally. Uh, and in future more, more drivers will come out. For example, the latest MongoDB driver for Java supports the, the reactive streams protocol. So if you're using that, you can just wrap it in Rx Java or Akka streams and, and you will get the same properties that we described here. So it's, it's gaining a lot of traction. Uh, Java 9 will have a set of APIs in java.util.concurrent uh, which will be called as I think flow, flow APIs and those will implement this protocol. So reactive streams is right now an open source initiative but uh, it is being standardized. So after that I think all the drivers can just say that okay we, we specify, we, we implement a reactive streams protocol. Okay, so I think we saw, we saw the difference between the pull and the push based. The, the pull based systems are synchronous because you're pulling data of course, unless you get the re result back you, you are not done. That's why they are blocking uh, and there is a natural back pressure. You never run out of maybe why because you are working with one item and unless you are finished with that item, you don't even make a call to the next item. So, so there is no notion of overflow, back pressure is inbuilt. Push based systems are asynchronous, they are non-blocking, they are good for high throughput. Uh, but if the downstream is slower than the upstream, if upstream is spitting out more data faster, then, uh, uh, then the buffers can overflow. There is a, the, you can do cheating and you can say that, okay, the downstream will block. Uh, so if you are Rx, Rx Java has been in use for even before the hybrid approach for a long time before the reactive streams. But uh, it was easy to cheat there because you know what, the last part, the subscriber will be a blocking subscriber. And which means that uh, it will block all, this, all the calls on next calls. So you, you lose some of the advantage, but you get the back pressure. But now if you want best of the both, both worlds, that is what uh, reactive streams are. 
I mentioned about cold streams, right? Uh, now, what is the difference between hot and cold? Now, uh, in the lazy streams, it's important that there is a sink or there is a terminal action. Uh, so, without, without that, the data flow will not start because till that point, you're just specifying how data should be transformed, right? But it is, it may not be, it, it is not essential uh, in cases when uh, the source, uh, for example, if you want to model uh, click of mouse on a, in a UI programming model as a source of events, right, which is, which is streaming the events. Now you don't, you don't say that unless there is one subscriber, I will, I will, I will not even stream the, the click events, right? Or for example, if you want to model the time, which is flowing infinitely, you don't expect a subscriber. So those sources, which are push based models, right, but they don't need a specific trigger. They are always emitting data. So what happens to that data? Well, that, that data gets dropped. That in the, in the conceptual model, there is no consumer, so that data gets dropped. Though time ticks or the mouse clicks, they get dropped. And uh, uh, in those cases, those sources are called as hot sources. Uh, they don't need explicit, explicit subscription basically to be triggered and uh, that's why they're called hot sources. The cold sources are the most important sources that we deal with. For example, web services, uh, reading from file, all the IO operations, right, which we control, the data, the data oriented APIs. Uh, right, so that is, that is the main difference. Uh, before I go to the demos, uh, I think I, I need to cover uh, one more, one more aspect. So we motivated all this that, okay, uh, the collections which are eager and in memory are, are very good because you can create graphs without thinking about them. But now that we are, you have lazy pipelines, we have looked only with the linear flows for the pull based as well as push based. The moment you think about graphs or the branches, things become very complicated. For example, uh, forget about whether it is pull based or push based, if it is a lazy pipeline and if there is a notion of split, you read from a source and uh, you have to do the same two operations, the, the doubling and the squaring. You have two options. The first one is the simple one. You read uh, twice. So each pipeline is completely independent. So there is no real branching. They are, they are two independent pipelines. Again, very, very easy to reason about, but the cost is that the read will happen twice. Uh, and the second one, where uh, if the read operation is across the network, you may not want to do that. So you will memoize. Uh, in some way, the, the uh, results of the read, and then will uh, those those memoirs results will be used by the by the two branches, which are which are square and and double. And you have to take care of that. If you don't do that, then well, you get you get some advantage of the lazy lazy pipelines, but maybe it's uh, 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 not not all the advantages. And and in fact, you can argue that now, depending on the use case, in memory collections will be more efficient. So look at the first, look at the first, right? Now, if your reading operation is the most expensive operation of all the pipeline, right? And you're reading twice. Compare this with the in-memory collection where you're reading once and then branching out immutable collections. The in eager Im immutable collections will be much more faster. Even though they are allocated all the time in memory, they will be faster because, because the bottleneck is not there in the allocation, bottleneck is in the reading, which is IO operation, which is much, much more expensive and you're doing it twice. So lazy collections are not naturally superior uh, to the in-memory collections. I mean, that is the lesson. I mean, that's why people use the eager collections uh, all the time. They are good because the lazy collections are good because they can deal with a large amount of infinite amount of data because they don't load everything in memory, but there is a cost to remember. And if you want to get rid of that cost, then we have to do something which is shown down there, which is memoization, which is that, okay, after read, you store that somewhere in memory, like a eager collection, and then downstream you, 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 share, you share that data. So let me show you the demo, uh, but I will just uh, give you some, some analogies. So if you are using C sharp, for example, and if you, if you work with the basic link interface, I enumerable, I guess, then, uh, and if you keep passing that around, you are in the first diagram, right? You are always doing the things twice. So the, the recommendation is that, okay, you quickly uh, make into an in-memory collection, two list or whatever, and then pass that two list so that it's memoized. Same thing will apply to Java 8 collections. If you are working with streams, Java 8 streams, uh, and uh, 
it's not even advisable to pass around the streams uh, uh, across the across the functions because they're immutable. Uh, they're they're mutable. They're they're like uh, perishable. But if you do, then well, you will be you will be having some weird effects. Uh, but uh, but similar situation, right? So what you do even in Java 8 is that when you have to pass uh, a part of your your uh, your logic and and to the different branches, you first make it into in memory collection like like a standard Java collection and then pass that part. Is that is that clear that analogy? Okay. Uh, third one is the Spark, right? It's a big data frame. How how many of you heard of Spark? It's a big data platform, right? So Spark is uh, is an alternative to the map reduce paradigm. Uh, it it provides similar to the collection like API and Scala collections, uh, but by default, it follows the first first diagram where everything is repeated twice. And uh, if you are writing an iterative algorithm, which is very common in the big data and, and machine learning, uh, then uh, it's not very efficient because each time you will be reading from HDFS, which will be the the, the biggest bottleneck of your uh, uh, your application. So what you do there is uh, after after a certain point when you have read, filtered, and and have a amount of data which can now fit in memory. You you say that okay cache or persist and the data will be persisted in memory and then downstreams will 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 use that uh, from there. Okay, so let's uh, let's go to the pull based uh, example just to uh, make how make it clear. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, uh, show you a perishable collection. A pull-based perishable collection, right? And uh, what does that mean? Uh, it's similar to Java eight streams or Scala iterators, where uh, uh, where the streams uh, they get consumed. So iterator, if you call next, 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 it gets consumed, similar to Java eight streams, right? Uh, so what happens, uh, right? So if you and I'm 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 doing the forking operation on them, uh, which is very similar to what we did earlier for eager collections. First pipeline will do squaring, take the 10 items. Second pipeline will do the doubling and take the five items, right? And I would like to see what is the effect. So if it is a perishable collection and uh, I don't memoize, and if I run this, now let me press the correct shortcut. Okay, let's see what happens. Uh, so you you read uh, one to 10, right? And then uh, you you say square, so you get the square of, 1 to 10, I'm not printing the squared number, I'm just printing which numbers are being squared, 1 to 10. But then for doubling, it starts from 11. Even though you wanted to basically double the first 5, which is 1 to 5, it starts. Why? Because the stream was perishable, so it perished the first 10 items, so it will it will start from, from 11. If uh, it is a different implementation like Java streams, maybe it will throw an error uh, at this point. Okay, but if you memoize it, and there are different ways to memoize, uh, I can I can just quickly show you that, and then uh, there is different ways to memoize. One is that you can do full memoization, like C sharp uh, uh, I enumerable to list. Uh, in in Scala, there is there is a similar data structure called views, uh, where you can say to list, it will come in memory. Uh, RDD Spark RDD has a method called cache, so it will come. It's a full memoization. It's it's a very risky operation. You have to each time you do that. You have to know that okay, how your application is going to evolve, how much memory it could it could have at this point before you call that up. But very essential if you work with lazy pipelines. It could also be incremental. So you you convert a view. You start programming with a with a lazy structure, but then you convert into a structure which a data structure which automatically does memoization at, as it goes, right? Uh, and that's why the incremental and the automatic options are very similar. The automatic is the data structure itself is built in such a way that as you go programming with that, uh, the data which is being used is memoized incrementally all, all the time. But if that is not the case, you explicitly convert to that data structure. What are the example of these data structures? In closure, if you use the uh, uh, sequences uh, or, or the basic collections in, in closure, right, they are lazy and they get uh, memoized. Uh, you don't have to do explicit step of memoization. So as, as you process, right, they get memoized in the memory. Uh, in Scala, the equivalent uh, data structure is called a streams. They also have the same thing. It's never used in the production code, in Scala at least, because you never know how much data will come in memory. You have to be very careful. If you know that, okay, I will, I know that maximum data will fit in the memory and 
the whole collection will get garbage collected uh, uh, soon after. I will use that, uh, but otherwise uh, I will avoid it. And uh, there are there are some scala specific things called duplicate. Let's let's not go there. So I'm just going to show you that same perishable pipeline. If I deal with a memoize version, then uh, uh, whichever whichever it doesn't matter. Then how will the output look? Okay. Now I have one to one to ten, which are red. They are squared, and one to five, which are which are doubled. And in the in the process, I also basically manage to not read them twice because they are now memoized in some form. I don't I don't care which way, but they are they are in memory, and from there uh, they will they will be doubled. Okay, so that was uh, that was about the perishable. What about the reusable? Like C sharp or or uh, Spark. Let's see. So if I run the same case with a simple, without any memoization, what happens? I I read the ten, first ten. I square them. Then I read the first five again, and then I I double them. Right? Expected, because these are the lazy pipelines which are not memoized, uh, but they are not perishable. That's why they don't start with eleven. They start with the first, right? Analogy is C sharp and and Spark. Well, if I do memoization, whichever way there are multiple possibilities, I will get the same result as we, as we saw earlier. So I I see one to ten being read, they are being squared, and then one to five are being doubled, but they are not being read again. So that is that is a difference. Okay, enough uh, about uh, about the pull best. Now I need to I think I think the next demo is about the push best. Any any question on this? Pull best system so far. Okay, so let me. Now <coughs> things become slightly even more complicated if it is a push best system. Now you can't you can't do the I mean yeah you have to get the things in memory, uh, but the terminology that okay this sorry this this one slide this is this just just the summary. So the lazy pipelines are pull best and push best. Push best are the right hand side which is empty right now. Uh, pull based systems uh, they use iterators terminal action triggers the data flow uh, on uh, uh, in these iterators they could be perishable or reusable we saw the examples both of them you can you can memoize or cache or some some form and then uh, uh, you can use them uh, multiple times basically right so reuse is possible within a single consumption right the same pipeline you can you can reuse uh, for reusable collection if you don't memoize you can still reuse them but then it is multiple consumptions, so the pipeline starts all all the way from the beginning. Uh, cool. So now, now for the push-based system, uh, the equivalent notion of of memoization, the ter the terminology there is multicast, right? What you want to what you want to see is when you come to this pipeline, uh, because it's push-based, uh, you want ability to to broadcast or multicast to the multiple subscribers at the same time so the the pipeline is linear till a point and then it it will broadcast after that point because it is a push based uh, the 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 mental model is slightly different here uh, so how does it work well let's start with a uh, with a hot stream hot stream is like a stream which is which is spitting data without having to worry about if there is a subscriber or not and let's make it a unicast which means that if there are multiple subscribers uh, it it can't deal with it it will throw an exception and then i i do the same use case which i did earlier but with a with now this is slightly more complicated because here it is a push based system and time is involved so what i do i have a squaring flow and a doubling flow very similar to what what we did earlier but i throttle i say that when i am i am doing squaring throttle it for uh, so emit each item with a delay of 200 milliseconds and for doubling emit each item with a 100 millisecond delay so that i can show you the difference how 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 it works and then i create two separate graphs in the fork with with those with those uh, uh, two two transformations i run them and then i run them with a with a difference of half second 500 milliseconds so there's like all all things are starting different times so that you can see the difference when when it runs now let's see how how it works so if i if i run this okay so the exception happens when the second flow tries to attach second subscriber tries to attach the same unicast uh, a data flow but before that what happens it starts reading from the source the source is an infinite stream i have created right 
and uh, it is emitting data at, uh, I think I did not show you that, so let me just go there. The source should be number stream. Number stream is emitting data at a delay of 50 milliseconds, right? So uh, it starts emitting one, two, three, four, right? And then the squaring flow, which is squaring subscriber, which has attached, right? Gets some of those elements, so it gets one, it will square that, but then it will miss out on others because you know what? It is working at a different frequency. The squaring flow is moving ahead at a, at a delay of I think 200 milliseconds while uh, our, our original source is moving at a delay of only 50 milliseconds. So there is, a, there is a mismatch, so there will be many elements which will be read, but they will not be squared. And because this is a hot source, it is possible. Those elements will be dropped. And you see that, okay, one, two, three, four, one is being squared, two, three, four are being dropped, and the five being squared, and then nine being squared, and so on. And I think roughly this difference maps to the difference between the frequency. Uh, one, one is at a 50 hertz, and one is at a, not 50 hertz, one is, one is emitting with a delay of 50 milliseconds and the other, other with a 200 milliseconds, difference of four. Okay, so this is, uh, this is about squaring and doubling even doesn't start because it's a unicast. Uh, if it were a multicast, what will happen? Uh, very similar, but both the flow will come in, come in action. So, right. So it will start reading, start squaring, and then some, after some time, after a delay of half second, in the beginning, the doubling flow will attach. It will get the first element will be eight. It will start doubling eight and then 10 and 13 and all that. So all the things are working independent of each other. They're not bothering whether, whether the downstream is, uh, downstream is catching up. They are just dropping elements, right? So these are the hot sources. Now what happens if you do something similar with the cold sources? Let's start with the unicast. Okay, so, you start squaring one, two, three, four, right? You, you're reading, but you also double, okay, you, you do squaring one to 10, but you also manage to double one to five, right? And why is that? Because the source is cold, which means it cares about the subscribers, right? And it will not, it will not basically, uh, 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 it will push back, it will give the back pressure, and that is the important point, which is, which is a characteristic of the reactive streams, which we are going to, uh, uh, summarize uh, and uh, but but the difference is that it is reading twice so first is being read here and then it is also being read here why because this is a unique cast I have not made any arrangement to broadcast right so I get I get the full flow from the source not very efficient but uh, yes it doesn't drop any element it, it 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 says that okay source you slow down I'm, I'm not able to keep up and both of them have a different frequency uh, or a different uh, different speed and still they manage to they manage to consume all the data and you see that you read only the data which is required so you read 11th because there is some buffering uh, involved but you don't you don't read uh, uh, excessive data on the other hand if i multicast things will be different uh, and depending on how i multicast right so one multicast is the the one that i have shown you with a fork where i have a gap of 500 milliseconds before i attach the two subscriber if i do that then how does it look? Well, the first and foremost, the reading happens only once, one, two, three, four to 12, right? Reading is not repeating. So multicast is playing a role. But squaring is done for all the first 10 items, one to, one to 10. Unfortunately, doubling starts with four. But, but after that, it keeps up. It, it does four, five, six, seven, eight, and maybe nine, no, eight. Uh, so there is a drop of the first three elements. Why is that? Because well, that subscriber did not even attach. So how would, how would the source know that, okay, I need to hold on? It doesn't know all the, all the infinite subscribers which are going to be attached. So how do you solve this problem? Well, to solve this problem, what you need is, is a way of forming all your graphs and then having a single point of trigger. And it is possible in, the, in any implementation of reactive streams that you would, uh, you would use, a cut streams, has a way of doing it. Uh, Rx Java has a way of doing it, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to do that. The the only difference here is is a multicast fork, which which is a separate method. And you see, I'm not going to describe what you see there, but it's a it's a DSL for describing a graph. So you build the whole graph of your consumers. Roughly, you say that okay, the data will come from here, will go to the input port of broadcast join, uh, and the, there are two output ports, and the data will go first 
to the squaring flow and then to doubling flow and then they will go to the sink. And the whole graph is a single entity and I trigger, I do run on the whole graph at one, at one point uh, as compared to the two runs that I have done earlier. So if I do that, then, then theoretically it's possible that uh, I will, okay, let me go back to where I was. I will be able to get what I want. Okay, so now I'm able to read the, the 12 uh, or, or just, just enough items, only once. I'm able to square the first 10 and I'm able to double the first 10 with the back pressure and all that, which is, which is a very nice uh, property. Just to summarize, uh, push-based pipelines, right? They, uh, the data is pushed to the subscribers uh, and uh, the examples are mentioned there. Uh, by the way, in the Spark world also, there is an equivalent of that called DStream, which is for streaming data in Spark. Uh, and then uh, they could be hot or cold. Uh, we saw the differences. Uh, both of them you can multicast, right? If you multicast, then yes, you can attach multiple subscriber and, and try to make some reuse. Uh, but the cold you can reuse without multicast. The only thing is that data will be read from the beginning. Uh, with the cold, one important property that we, we, we saw I think we had seen it in the diagram, uh, which is a back pressure that the upstream will not send me the data more than I demanded. I did not explicitly say that, okay, give me 10 bytes or 20 bytes. That was done in the, in the uh, APIs that I used of the Akka streams library. And uh, because of that, I'm assured that if the data source is cold, like a web service or a file, a uh, huge file, then I'll be able to give back pressure and, and, uh, uh, and not over, overwhelm myself. So that is a that is a very very interesting property of uh, of these. Cool. So this this is the whole whole thing together. Let me just uh, show you. Uh, okay, I'm going to start uh, multiple. I'm using Akka cluster, so I'm going to start multiple uh, uh, JVMs. Ideally, this can be done on on any machine, uh, uh, multiple machines. If if you're using AWS and stuff like that. Uh, and I just refresh this page. So, cool. So this is this is my UI, right? Uh, let's not worry about the UI right now. Let's start something, uh, uh, another node basically in the cluster. And because this is a cluster, they will send messages to each other, and they will they will form a cluster. Uh, they should rather if the network doesn't doesn't fail. Uh, uh, using seed nodes, so it detected. Now you see the the two lines appeared in the first first one. It, it detected there are two members which are up itself and and a peer, right? And now that information is also given to the browser. So so now browser has a node, right? Initially, if you had clicked, there was no node. So I can say that this node is very fast right now. It's okay. Let's see if it is really fast. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to see this in the browser. So this is this is that uh, Big Bug Bunny movie, right? Uh, and this is not a video, right? This is not a video codec. I have taken the the M MOV file, and I have split using FFmpeg. I have split into JPEG images. So I have like 10,000 JPEG images which are going going in a loop. So I'm rendering images in the browser. So this is not an encoded video. This these are images which are being rendered on canvas, right? And they are very fast right now. I and it will it will spoil my demo because because my next steps. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throttle. Now I am using kind of Akka cluster messaging to say that okay throttle uh, with a delay of 100 milliseconds, right? Which means that only 10. So if I throttle this, the movie will become slow, right? Why? Because now the frames have become slow, and then you can you can you can play with this, but that's that's not the objective. What I want to do is add more nodes. So right now I have only one node, so I can't make interesting connections. So I can add more node to the cluster. So I can say that, okay, I want, I want to rotate this image. I want another machine. Right now it will happen on my machine, but in the real application we do this on AWS. We take a 16 CPU machine because image processing is a CPU bound operation. And on that we say that, okay, rotate, uh, uh, rotate this node. Uh, ideally this node should get detected. And I think it, it got detected here, right? It says that, and if it is detected here, then uh, the UI should have that information, and it has. So now I can connect the two. I can say that take this wave friend and push the data to the rotator node, which will, which will rotate this and create a connection. If I do this, then I have a rotator machine and to which I can connect. I can see that 
these two videos are now in sync, but but uh, but they are they are transforming the image and then rendering it, right? So so I'm creating now a graph, a, a, a topology which can which can which can get very complicated. So for example, I can say that okay, uh, add add one more node, which is which will extract the metadata out of uh, uh, out of our uh, source images, right? What is the size? What is the timestamp? So that so that we can measure some some uh, metric uh, uh, from that metadata. And uh, I will say that, okay, I also want to measure that metric. So there is yet another node. So now we have one, two, three, four, five nodes, which are all part of the cluster. Uh, and they are talking uh, 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 to each other. Uh, so now I go here and I say that what I want to see in the end is, okay, the data is not come here yet. Okay, now there is a metric. It will not show me anything right now. I am connected to the stream. But the stream doesn't have any data because I haven't, I haven't made the connection. So let's make the connection. Uh, I'll just, okay. To make a connection, I will say that, okay, now from wavefront, uh, push out data to the metadata. So that connection will be formed, but no metric. Then I say that, okay, from metadata, get the data and push it on the metric and make this connection. And, and now we'll start seeing the streaming data. Now this is a JSON streaming data of the metric. What is the metric? Okay, what is the size of bytes? How many bytes are being processed per second? How many images are being processed per second? And what is the latency per image which is being processed? And latency is in milliseconds. Of course, it is on my machine, so that's why it's two milliseconds. But even on AWS, right, with a good network, it will be less than 10 milliseconds. Uh, and uh, let's let's see if, if the throughput increases. So I'm just going to, I'm, this might crash my machine because this rotator node, rotator stage is very, very nasty. But let me just uh, increase the throughput to some other value. And you see that suddenly my count has increased, right? Because now my latency is 33 milliseconds. I can spit out 30 images per second. So not only the movie is running faster, but uh, but uh, my, my metric is being computed appropriately. My latency remains almost the same, right? So uh, the internally the code is, it's a, it's a big project. It's all open source. If you want to, I, I'll share the link. Uh, uh, roughly, the link is if you if you go to GitHub, uh, TMT software bulk data, right? There is uh, there is all the source that you will need. There are a lot of other use cases that we have implemented. There is also a detailed documentation that we have done. We haven't put it on the page yet. Maybe next week or or within 15 days we'll put it. Uh, it's the all all the work is in open source domain, so you should be able to read read up and uh, and uh, uh, see see what is the uh, what is the underlying? Okay, let me just throttle this back. Uh, but but the lesson here is that streaming is is a, is a very very nice uh, a way of dealing with things. Streaming is is a very nice abstraction within a node. Uh, when we have to do image processing, uh, we do this image processing in parallel. Otherwise, uh, it will be too slow because it's CPU bound and we have a cluster of 16. How do we do it in parallel? Because of the uh, so let me go to bulk data and say that. Uh, uh, image transformations. So it's, it's just literally one line here. So which says that, okay, look at this line. So it says that images map async with a level of parallelism and actually make a call to the rotate. And rotate is the actual rotation. I mean, this is this is a Java API call you can assume. Uh, and uh, the the level of parallelism will determine how many images in parallel you want to process. So streaming APIs will allow you to do these things in a very, very declarative, very straightforward manner. Unfortunately, uh, none of these, I mean, these are not the big data streams like uh, like Spark streams or, or Storm and all that. These are like still for the application developers. They don't run on in the distributed fashion yet. So you can't say that, okay, I create my graph and I say that, okay, this part of the uh, 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 work will be done on that machine and this will be done on that machine. That is still not available in a streams at least. So what we have done is, uh, we have used ACA cluster features to communicate between the nodes, but we have used ACA streams within the within the node to to do these transformations. I think yeah, that's that's what I wanted to uh, talk about. Uh, so any questions? I didn't get the idea. Like uh, what we said, it's a sync feature, right? Uh, when we are calling in the push system or a hybrid system, but you have sequentialized the things. Your images were coming one after the other. Right. It is ordered. Right. Uh, so, so they are diff so async and ordering. They are two different concerns. And uh, you are right. If I don't care about order, 
theoretically I can get higher throughput, right? But it is not essential that async things must be unordered, right? So when you say that, okay, give me 10, 10 items and give me 15 items, and the upstream starts you giving total 25 items, it is not meant that they will give in any order, right? Order will be maintained in the streams by default. You can, you can uh, override that. For example, this map async, right? There are two versions of map. You want to do things in parallel. But do you want to lose order? No, because then your video will not look correct, right? So what do you do? You have another version which is called map async unordered. And if you say that, okay, no, in my domain, my stream, I don't care about order. I will do this and theoretically, maybe better throughput. Uh, not always, but depends on your use case. So, so they, they are separate concerns and, and in the streaming order is generally preserved unless, unless you, you remove that. So, uh, in the hybrid approach, can we have two different upstreams and uh, we can fetch uh, two large files from two different upstreams and uh, I'll provide the reactive system, I'll provide that from this upstream I fetched X data I need Y from second upstream because X is already there with me. You can do that. You can you can do now. You you will also obviously think. For example, uh, you have one stream of say images, and you have another stream which gives you some image metadata, right? And now you want to get those and then combine the two, right? And then do some transformation and then split the two. All these possibilities. That's why they are called graphs. Right? Graphs means that, okay, you can have merge operation, you can have a broadcast operation, and you can have, you can, in, you can also have cycles, which, I mean, they are not recommended, but, but the, the, the real streaming system will have the ability to introduce cycles if required, because cycles can play a feedback, right? So you can say that, okay, if in my pipeline, if the data is flowing too fast, that is detected by a node, I will have a, a cyclical input to the upstream. You can, the whole, like the electronics circuit, right? You can, you can have feedback and that can slow down, uh, right? So everything is possible because that's why they're called graphs. Implications you'll have to think about. That, okay, what happens if my, one of the image stream is very slow, my metadata stream is very fast. And that will depend on the operation that you want to do now. So the operation, zip, zip operation, for example, will wait, not by blocking, but by suspending, uh, unless, unless you get, two new items from, from both of them, and then we'll keep zipping, like a zip operation, right? But if you, if you use some other alternative, uh, then it will combine latest is the, is the combinator which Rx uses, then it will just, uh, uh, any, 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 anything which, is, which gets emitted from one stream will create a pair of the latest value on the other stream and that, that new value. So you will have to use different combinators, you will have to understand what, what, what is the implication. Uh, a good implementation will never block good implementation will give you end-to-end -end back pressure, which means that your throughput will reduce. Even though one, one source is very capable of processing data, in the interest of complete back pressure, you will, you will say that, no, be the, uh, I'll, I'll, you, you, you come down because the, the whole graph is big and the common denominator is very, very slow. So you will bring the whole thing down, but it should work. I mean, good implementation of a streaming graph system will, will allow you to do that. Akka streams allow you to do that. No, I think that's, I don't know about that domain, that why it goes out of sync. But that is not about the async, that is about if the merging is not happened properly. In the reactive system, there is a world called glitch. Uh, have you heard of functional reactive programming, right, FRP? So FRP is basically taking the idea of reactive systems and where you care so much about time that you have a notion of a continuous time. Uh, and those are systems, difficult to, the theorem, the if you want the theoretically correct FRP implementation, they're difficult to do. But those, those systems prevent all kinds of glitches. So I can, I can say that, okay, what you're saying will, could be a, a glitch which will arise in a non-FRP system, which all of these are, even including Rx, it's a non-FRP system. But in theoretical FRP-based systems, the glitches are prevented, but they at the cost of something else. Cool then, is that, is that it? Thank you.